Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, before we get started with our first speaker of the day, I'd like to take just a second to thank the Platinum sponsors, Merrick Health, uh, First Detachment, Designs for Sport, the Dolphin Neurostem, and Shaley Soren Wellness. And please give it up for our first speaker of the day, Justin Harris. Thank you. Like you said, I'm Justin Harris, or as the announcer at a 10th grade wrestling tournament, Justine Harris. So I'm talking about pre-contest uh, bodybuilding, uh, but pre-contest dieting. Uh, like I said, I, I'd like to do q and I'd like to do exclusively Q&A. Uh, we can also do weight cutting for powerlifting as part of the pre-contest. But any question you have about anything related to contest prep, if we don't have any questions, I'll just start going like through my talk. But I've done a lot of these, and when I just go through my talk, people, it's not as exciting. People, their minds start wandering. When you're engaged with actual questions, it gets a better dialogue. So does anyone have any? Todd, thank you. Oh, can you go up to the mic? If you can. If you don't want to go to the mic, just yell, and I'll repeat it. I don't mind. Hello. All right, so I've always been confused with how to actually integrate the insulin use with the high-carb days and the necessity or lack of necessity for sugar on those high carb days? Well, very, very good question. So I, I, in my opinion, people historically have used insulin backwards. What, what people usually do is you'd always see you have to eat 10 grams of carbs per one IU of insulin or whatever to cover the insulin. And so people select an insulin dose and then eat enough to not die. But they have no idea if that is a, if too much food, if that's causing fat gain. And typically what it is is they overeat to make sure they don't go hypo, and they do get fat. And so everyone says insulin makes you fat. The truth is insulin will keep you leaner, and I'll, I'll explain how. So imagine I have a high-carb day, and my high-carb days are very high when dieting because it's our one day during the week where we do any glycogen storage. So for like someone like Todd, it's probably as much as 900 grams of carbs on that day. But we have that day, it'll be lower protein and very, very low fat. But we have that day and we've, we've utilized that day and we've adjusted it until it's dialed in. And we know the high day's working, his contest prep's working, he's on track, he's losing two pounds of fat a week. We know he can, he can absorb those carbs. Now we add and we apply insulin to it. And instead of picking an insulin dose and adjusting the diet, we pick the diet that we know our body is already responding to and not storing body fat and build up the insulin dose to it. And I like to use fast-acting insulin, uh, preferably Humalog because it's easier to control and th with three meals of the day, basically every other meal, essentially. And so, what, and you start low, you know, four IUs or something like that, and you titrate up to you find either by tracking your blood sugar or by the feelings of hypoglycemia, right at the level where you just about go hypo when the insulin peaks, and you, you kind of, one IU below that will be our dose. And so how does that keep you leaner? Well, we already, we already know we can eat that high day and we're not storing body fat. Now when we add insulin to it, we are more efficiently using those calories. So more of those carbohydrates, some of those carbohydrates that might otherwise have been, be, go through the fatty acid synthesis process and be stored as body fat, can now be stored as glycogen with some super compensation you know, from the, because of the insulin. And some of the amino acids that we eat that might have otherwise been converted to glucose and then gone through the fatty acid pathway, can now potentially be converted to new muscle tissue. Because what insulin does, I should have used the lapel mic, uh, I, always, I always think of receptors in the body just like this, like a little basket. And then hormones float around, and the hormone that fits that basket will lock in there. And that's how insulin works. Insulin goes into the cell. It, it's a ligand binding system. It shuffles some proteins around, and it basically like opens like your shower drain to allow nutrients into the cell better. And so you have an increased uptake of amino acids so if there is protein synthesis due to your training, it's more likely to occur. So the exact same diet, now when insulin is applied properly, you'll have more muscle mass, better glycogen storage, and less body fat. Now it's a small amount, you know, we're talking a few grams each time, but if you, you know, a few grams over, you know, every high day, week after week after week for 10 years, adds up to a dramatically different physique. And that's why it's, it's driven me crazy for 20 years, Almost everyone uses, even the experts, even the ones tracking blood sugar properly and kind of adjusting the dose that way, are still doing it wrong because they all start with the insulin dose and then build the meal around it. You want to build the meal to a diet that you know is working, 
and then insulin will optimize it. So obviously I'm not a bodybuilder. I have a question about strongman competition. So we eat simple carbs throughout the whole competition. And if it's a two day competition, that's like a couple boxes of cereal kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So leading up to that, I'm a weight class athlete. I have to diet down anyway. Should I restrict carbohydrates before the competition even more just to help with the sensitivity at competition? But it depends. I wouldn't, for sensitivity, I would not. For making weight, I would. Right. But I'll use, a, I'll use the case where, I'll just use a, an extreme case because you can always do a little bit less of this and, you know, for a less extreme case. Let's take someone, uh, someone his size who needs to cut 30 pounds to make weight. You know, it sounds like a lot, right? And if anyone, people that are in the sport knows that uh, uh, Matt Krozaleski's 2008 uh, 220 all-time record, uh, he was 260 on the, on the meet, or on the, on the platform, and he was 263 days before. Uh, ben Pollock, he ended up not making it to the U.S. Open, uh, but his last U.S. Open, he was going to do at 181. We were going to start his water cutting process at 227. So the, the people are doing extreme water cuts. It's not healthy at all. No, but not, you know, I mean, it's just not. But there's nothing healthy about lifting the most weight anyone's ever lifted at a certain body weight. So what, what we would do for that is first weeks out, we'll water and sodium load. And we'll work your sodium intake up six to eight grams a day to start, then probably up to eight and even 10 grams a day of sodium. And what that does, your body adjusts its aldosterone production to get used to flushing out sodium. When you first eat sodium, you hold extra water, but your body has to maintain water at 0.9% or maintain your blood at 0.9% sodium. So when, so when you know, the sodium level goes up, your fluid volume goes up and you hold water because it has to maintain that balance. But the body doesn't want all that fluid, so eventually it learns to increase the amount of sodium it flushes out. What happens is that the distal tubula of the kidneys, more, like some sodium gets reabsorbed, that process gets adjusted so less sodium gets reabsorbed and more stays in the urine. And so you get used to flushing a lot of sodium per day. Same thing with fluid. We'll get your fluid in up, uptake, uh, intake up to eight liters per day. Eight liters is about 16, almost 17 pounds of water weight. So you're, when you, you're used to drinking that and peeing that out each day, you're flushing out 17 pounds of water each day, which then we can shut off and it, until, until your, your body adjusts its vasopressin, which is how much you know, fluid you excrete, but you'll, you'll, you basically will pee out 17 pounds. You know, it adjusts pretty quick, so you don't get that. But that, that's how we start out. So we go into the peak, say, uh, for a Friday weigh-in. This would be uh, Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning, we'll start, we'll go very low carb, and, and we'll go very low sodium. And so you, your body is still used to flushing out 10 grams of sodium per day. In that first day, you're pretty much going to flush out 10 grams of sodium. We're keeping water high because we want to keep that process going. <coughs> The next day, very low carb again, uh, very low sodium again, very high water again. Then the last day, we'll start pulling water. We still do low sodium, very low carb, and now if we can shut water off completely, we have up to 17 pounds just from there. But you, you can do the math for this. So we'd say someone his size, just for round numbers, say they can store like 1,000 grams of glycogen, uh, of carbs as glycogen, with uh, four to four and a half times as much water for every gram of carbohydrate as glycogen. So you're talking upwards of five kilograms or like 11 pounds. So there's 11 pounds in glycogen weight that we've lost before we start the water cutting. That sodium cutting, well, because 70% of your water, our body is water, there's a lot of water we can flush out when sodium gets down because it, it the blood has to stay at that 0.9%. So we've gone very, very, very high sodium and got used to flushing all the sodium. We shut the sodium spigot off, that blood sodium concentration goes way down and the only way to get it back up is to flush out water. So you, you, can, you can expect another 10, up to 10 pounds there. So we're already at 21 pounds, and we're drinking eight liters, of eight liters of water a day, and we're already down 21 pounds. And so we have up to 17 pounds after that, and you do that plus, you know, a little sauna, or a, a hotel sauna. For anyone who's ever in a bind, you're in a hotel, and you can't find a sauna, do it. a hotel sauna is, sh ho ho uh, hotel shower systems never really run out of hot water. I mean, they have too many rooms, they have to... So if you, go in the sh if you go in your shower, turn the shower on full hot, turn the uh, sink on full hot, seal up the door, and lay under some blankets, it'll turn into a very, very hot steam bath. You just watch a movie for two hours, and all that combined, so we have 17 plus about uh, 10 or 11 plus another 10 
were uh, over 30 pounds. So, and then, what, and then after that, after you make weight, immediately after stepping off the scale, and you're gonna be, you know, your blood pressure is gonna be very low, you're gonna be wobbly, almost blacking out. As Soon as you step off the scale, we'll do a uh, uh, high molecular weight carbohydrate, like our product, Field Rations, heavily diluted, so something like 50 grams of carbs per almost a gallon of fluid, and we'll add extra baking soda into it. And the baking soda is really just for the sodium, but the baking soda is also, you know, it's, it's alkaline, so it calms your stomach. You can actually, if you ever have re acid reflux and want to shut it down immediately, mix like a teaspoon of baking soda with eight ounce, six ounces of water, swirl it up, let it dissolve, chug it. It'll taste like shit, like salt water, but that'll mix with all the acid. It'll neutralize the acid. And remember those volcanoes kids would make in like fifth grade science experiment? That's what'll happen to your stomach. And you'll, you'll let out a huge burp and that's all that acid mixing with the, with the alkalinity and it, you'll, your acid reflux will be gone. But we do that, we add the baking soda for the sodium and also for that reason, because we're gonna go back home and immediately start eating and drinking. And we wanna get like three gallons of fluid in, preferably at the, at the carbohy with carbohydrates added at the strength of half strength Gatorade. So if you know anything about Gatorade, it, it was made for the Florida Gators in like the 1960s. And the original formulation was just purely for, you know, exercise physiology, not for taste or anything like that. And so it was much fewer carbohydrates because they wanted to stay under the limit where insulin would get, start getting secreted because insulin is a central nervous system depressant. So they wanted something their players could have that would give them electrolytes and a few grams of carbohydrates. So if you drink straight Gatorade now, you know, after they had to market to the public, it's a little more than twice as much carbohydrates as it's supposed to, and it'll cause your stomach to bloat. But if you dilute it way down to like six, seven grams of carbs per serving, and then you can drink like three gallons of that a day and it never gets high enough where your stomach gets bloated or you get like any central nervous system depression from the insulin. And then we do the ramen protocol. And the ramen protocol, again, is just sodium and carbs. But you try to do two packets of ramen every two hours if possible. Because we need, for 30 pounds, that's about what you need to get, to get that many grams of sodium and, and water in. Because we want to get over 1,000 grams of carbs at least on the, after, the, after weigh-ins before, before we go to bed the night before the meet. But if you do all that, you'll regain the 30 pounds in 24 hours. So, and that's, I mean, it's an extreme process, but it's just all, you know, getting the water out of your body by manipulating water, sodium, and glycogen, and then getting it all right back in your body and accelerating it because of all those processes you did to get rid of it. Because after you do all that, your body wants to store sodium, wants to store water. And really, the only limiting factor is how much, is there, how much ramen can you get down. And it just, there's, you know, there's all, you can't do much more than three gallons of fluid and like, you know, 18 packs of ramen. That's about the limit of what people are able to get down. But if you could do more, if you could get four gallons of fluid and, you know, 22 packets of ramen, you could gain as much as 40 pounds. And actually, Dave Tate, we did that one year, and we dieted it down to like contest shape, basically like 240. And he came, I think he came here to Swiss, and he wanted to shock, because the last time everyone had saw him, he was in contest shape, basically shredded at 240. He wanted to shock everyone. So I think we got him up to 312 in like six weeks, where it was a rebound protocol, but then we did this bloat protocol without the water cut protocol. I think I made him sign a waiver because I was worried he's going to get flash pulmonary edema and die, but Dave, Dave's like a, a robot, right. So I've used your older berberine complex for a while, and now you have a new one out, which I bought, but I haven't tried yet. Can you speak to the best way to dose that during a prep, around training, as well as for a smaller competitor like me who only eats four meals a day instead of seven meals a day. How do I do the that's seven the, pills and all of that? The better, that's the best part about Suppressor Max. Suppressor Max is the only berberine product on the market now that's a once a day berberine product. The problem with berberine is it's not very bioavailable and it has a very short half-life. So to optimally use berberine, you really need to dose it at least three times a day and preferably even more. What we did is we added a, a 10 carbon chain fatty acid that's a permeability enhancer. It's called sodium caprate uh, or ca capriac, capriac acid or nonodexahydrocycline or something like that, which that's what we put on the label because it looks cooler. But, uh, but it, it, it's a permeability enhancer that increases the bioavailability of berberine so much that blood sugars uh, tend to be uh, improved 20 to 22 and a half percent over berberine alone, which is great because it's more effective. But the even better part is that the, but the suppressor max with the sodium cap rate will have more berberine still active in the body 
at the six hour mark than regular berberine does at the two hour mark. And it'll have more at the 10 hour mark than regular berberine will have at the three hour mark. So, so you know, like if you're do, dosing berberine two or three times a day, you're doing it every three hours, that's basically the same as our product once a day as far as blood concentrations go. So that's, the, that's the, the best part about it. The only negative is that it works too good. So some people are sensitive to berberine. If you are, this gets much more berberine in your system, so you'll be even more sensitive to it. But I mean, in the morning, yeah, meal one, yep. And every day, uh, every day, because it's not just for with high carb meals or just high carb days, but. This is a follow-up question to what, that question. So. I know that berberine is great for off-season, helping absorb carbohydrates similar to insulin. If so, I happen to be on 600 carbs a day, 14 units of GH, I still have an 80 fasting glucose. Mm -hmm. would, how would I benefit from berberine? Well, you are not the norm. <laughs> well, you'll always, well, see, uh, insulin or, carb, or blood sugar is really weird because the optimal blood sugar for getting shredded is actually really high blood sugar. If you've ever, like, that's what diabetic, type one diabetics used to die of. They used to die of 0% body fat. But, uh, but it's not a good look, because it's a muscle wasting look, you know, because your body can't utilize the sugar. It's always breaking down muscle tissue, trying to create more sugar. Blood sugar climbs outrageously high. You're in, in crazy high ketosis. Your ketones are large and, you know, it, it's, it's miserable. But, uh, but that's, that's the weird thing is, actual pure body, but for total body compensation, obviously you want improved insulin sensitivity. For someone like you, if you're, insulin, if you're that insulin sensitive, you probably don't need it. I mean, I'm not, I, you know, please buy it because I, I need to feed my family, but I, I'm not going to lie to someone, you know, like if, if you, but you do want a low, like you do want a fasting in the 80s. That's the thing, like normal's up to 100, but you're already seeing a dramatic shift in uh, what, how your body utilizes carbohydrates, how your body, all the processes we want to be optimized start dr falling off a cliff above 90. So even if you're medically in the normal range, you really want to be like around, 80 is about perfect, 75 to 85. You don't really want to be much below 75. That's like, you don't want to wake up hypoglycemic, but 80 is about perfect. So I guess thank mom and dad. <laughs> His mom and dad, not mine. <laughs> Uh, kind of going back to what you're saying about adding carbs to or adding insulin to the carbs, not vice versa. If you're structuring a pre-contest diet, and let's say you're beginning the diet at 800 grams of carbs on a high day, and then the first lever that you pull to get leaner is you add the insulin, would the next lever be to remove the insulin as the carbs come down, or would you lower the insulin alongside with the carbs as you progress? Uh, neither, because my carbs will never go down on a high day, uh, go up if anything. Typically what happens is high day either stays the same or we increase it deeper in the diet. Because we're using it more, like, it's like, instead of, we're not like carpet bombing the, the diet with carbs like we would in the off season with multiple high days. We get one day a week to get all our work done there. So what, basically with carb cycling, what you're doing is, the, the days that are not the high day in a fat loss diet are, we're just, we're going full bore. You know, very deep calorie deficit. We know we're depleting glycogen. We're pushing everything really hard. But, be, but because that we take that high day so high, we basically have six days of extreme fat loss and one day that we're storing calories. But that's actually ideal because we're not storing fat from those calories. So anytime, if you, if you eat more calories than you burn, your body's gonna find a place to store them. That's just, just like if you put gas in your car, it stays in the gas tank, it's no different. You know, so if you eat more calories than you burn, you're gonna store that exact number of calories somewhere in the body. But if what we're doing is we're depleting glycogen throughout the week, we're burning fat also, but then when we reintroduce those calories and we eat a hypercaloric diet, we're eating a diet in a, cal in a, carb in a glycogen de uh, deficit state where we're eating carbs. So we are storing all those calories, but rather than storing them as fat, we're storing them as glycogen. So it's, a, it's like a way to trick the system. And I don't even remember what the question was. I think I got sidetracked. So it's kind of like, so my thought process was, say, you know, 20 weeks out, mm -hmm. you're starting with a really high, high day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that said, yeah. High, yep. We would we would if we lowered the carbs, but we, we typically don't. Typically, at 20 weeks out, your high day will be a little lower because we're not getting as depleted, you know. And you're just coming out of the off season, so high day basically stays the same. Oral shoot up, and some guys will do 
like I'll have them do unlimited high days sometimes. Sometimes we'll get guys like Paul Barnett here, his metabolism, metabolism will start running away on a diet. And so we'll have to do high days where we just tell them, you know, get at least 1,000 grams of carbs in before a cheat meal and then end the night with a cheat meal. And that's another weird thing I do is I do the cheat meal at the end of the day. Uh, and I do, I have a planned cheat meal. And I've learned after over 20 years of doing this, whether or not I put the cheat meal in the diet, the cheat meal happens at some point. And at, at least this way, I, I know when it happens. You're not going to lie about it, and we can plan when it happens. And by placing it at the end of the high day, I know if you eat before bed, you're going to get fat. I mean, it, it, there's nothing special about eating before bed. You, over any given 24-hour period or 36-hour period or four-hour period or four-month period, if you eat more calories than you burn, you're going to store them. If you eat less calories than you burn, you're, so if we are storing calories from that, all it means is that we were in a calorie deficit some other time. But I have the, high, the cheat meal at the end of high day because we've had a ton of carbs all day. So your stomach is going to be as full as it's going to ever be the whole week. Your appetite's going to be, it's still going to be high, but it's going to be the lowest it's possibly going to be the entire week. And then also the, the ability to turn the cheat meal into a cheat day goes to zero because if I let you have the, high, the, cheat, the cheat meal on meal one, it's hard to go to chicken and broccoli for meal two. It's a lot easier to just extend that cheat meal as a meal two three, four, five, and oh, the whole day was a cheat day. This, we have to go to bed. And if you're doing, on a contest prep, you have to go to bed early because you gotta get up early to do cardio. So you're time, you're time constrained, you're appetite constrained, and, uh, and it's already a day that we accept as a storage day. Uh, so now that you've taken hundreds, if not thousands of clients through Contest preps, what do you look at as suggestions for people going through their first ones versus the more advanced athletes you're taking through their 10th, 20th? The more advanced ones will know this. The first ones, you're not lean enough. You're not. Your friends are telling you you look great in the gym and you do look shredded in the gym, you're still fat. You, you, contest conditioning, until you actually get it, is a different world. Because what, what happens is when, you're, when you look good in the gym, you will look like shit on stage. When you start looking like ghost face in the gym, you're still not gonna look good on stage. When the guys at the gym start bugging you and saying you've lost all your size and like saying they're worried about you, you're not gonna do well in the show, you're probably still not in shape. When your mom starts calling you and saying she wants to get you admitted because she knows you're dying, that's when you might be getting, it's, it, it is, if you, it's just, a di people just don't understand because the stage lights are di different. That's why you, you, like, you go on the internet and everyone's like, oh, he missed his peak. No, you were looking at pics of him all prep on Instagram in the gym, now he's on stage with mega bright lights that are, that are painfully blinding. And this, this many layers of protan, you know, that, that just basically acts as layers of fat each time, you know, and washed out. There, so it's a, it's a different, there's almost no one's in shape their first show, and everyone's worried they're not gonna be big enough. No one's big enough. There's 20 mass monsters on earth and they're all doing the Olympia. So you're, no mass monster is gonna be at your state show. The guy who's gonna win your show is, if it happens, the one guy who's absolutely shredded. That's, and typically there's no more than one guy at a show that is that. It's, but other, even at the national level, the, the light heavyweight is under 200 pounds, very often wins the overall, you know? So even, even turning professional, guys are not mass monsters. Everyone worries about size, and no one should worry about size. Everyone should worry about conditioning, because also size comes from conditioning. One, the more shredded you are, the bigger you look on stage. If you want to look small on stage, try to be big. I'll tell you what happens. I'll give you two examples. Say I, wanted, say, say I didn't want to make heavyweights. I wanted to be a super because I felt like I was big and I thought maybe that class would be a little easier. And so, at, so I don't diet hard enough, you know, and I make sure my weight stays high. And anytime it dips below 230, I, I worry and I eat a little bit. And then I get into peak week and I'm, you know, 230 and I realize I'm not lean enough. And, that, and somehow the dieter's eyes all vanish in peak week and you can see exactly how fat you are. All prep, you think you're leaner than you are or, you, or you know, your friends are telling you, it's like the, 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 the curtain, o curtain opens a couple days before the show and you realize, oh shit, I can't do anything about it now. But you try to, so you take too many diuretics and you end up on stage two, 225, flat, soggy, soft, your skin's smooth because you have no blood vessels because you're so, de so dehydrated. All the little microvasculature right near the surface of the skin. That's why Branch Warren always looks so grainy. He was brilliant about water manipulation because you want enough water still in the body that those small ve blood vessels can be filled because that's what creates that grainy, gritty look on the skin. When those deplete, that's when you get that smooth glazed donut look that people have sometimes. So that's what happens if you try to be big. 
If you do the opposite and you say, I'm making heavies, I don't care, I'll kill myself of them to make heavies, and you, get, you diet hard, you don't care about weight, you don't care about over-dieting, you starve yourself, and you get down to peak week and you're like 227 and you just can't lose any more weight, you can't, you, you, you can't make light heavies and you accept that you're going to make supers. Well, now you're shredded. You don't have to worry about spilling. You can carb up like a madman. You don't have to worry about trying to use a ton of diuretics and looking soft and soggy. And you up on, end up on stage 230, five pounds bigger, grainy, rock hard, full. That's all. So try to get small in prep. And, 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 the, the, like, and the, the, the top competitors, I don't have to say that. That's all they care about. Coach, I don't care. I, I'll die. I'm, get, get me shredded. Get me shredded. Coach, I need, more. I need to be shredded. You know, Ben, first time guys always worry about size. We got five minutes, so I'll try to wrap up with an, with an example peak week also. People usually like that. So if you're, let's say you've got a, a client doing multiple shows in a year, like Danny, for example, mm -hmm. like how do you manage that long of a gap between, because you're not really post-contest, you're not really pre-contest. hard. Yeah, or like is there a length of time that like minus a situation where it's like the Olympia, you'd say you can't, yeah. you got to compete within four weeks or something yeah. like that. So yeah. I, the, kind of the ideal would be competing two, every two weeks. Not every two weeks, but if you're going to do two shows, the second one being two weeks after. Three weeks is works. It starts to get hard to diet again for three more weeks. One week is really hard because you're peaking back to be back weeks. By the time you get to four weeks, you have a whole, you're going to a whole other month of dieting after you thought the diet was over. Those usually fall apart. So either, you know, one, two, or three weeks, if it's not that, then I usually recommend waiting, like, more than six months, you know. Just wait till, like, if you did a spring show and you're not sure about another one, you did a show in April and you're like, yeah, I'm looking at a show in mid-May, it's not going to work. It's, you, the diet's going to suck, you're going to hate it. Just pick a show in October or November. Okay, and then we got, like, two minutes. Hey, three. You got till 9.30. Oh, uh, oh, nine, yeah, I did start at 8. Yeah, okay, sweet, <laughs> awesome, okay. We got lots more to go then. All right. Sorry, I kind of shortened the last two responses thinking I was almost done. Oh, but I didn't use all the questions up. <laughs> so follow up to the previous question. Is there ever a downside to getting super, super lean, like 2.5% and then refilling into the show and then blasting water and sodium to the absolute limit? Like, can you spill over or can you lose your look if you go even if you have zero fat and then go too far with the yeah you can yeah i mean you still have to be somewhat cautious you know and like i hate peak week because the internet has made everyone think all the like <laughs> family guy did a joke about the guy from uh, old country with uh, old, no country for old men the guy's hair they said it's long in all the short parts and short in all the long parts and that's how people treat contest prep. They like they're short in all the long parts and long in all the short parts. They they worry about they worry about the carb up, and they think the carb up's going to change the look. Carving up makes you look a little better, but your look changes from being dry. Yeah, and you're not going to turn into Ronnie Coleman when you carb up. That's another one. Everyone thinks like I'm flat, but once I get some carbs in me, no, go watch. You you used to be able to watch the battle for the Olympias and see what the pros looked like at four weeks out, three weeks out, two weeks out, five weeks out. You know, Ronnie Coleman, the unbelievable. He's almost six weeks out in that video. He could step on stage. You're either in shape or you're not. The carb up does improve your look a little bit, but here's how much it improves your look, right? We said like 1,000 grams of carbs, right? Over a basically 100 kilogram body, you know? That's like one gram per kilogram, you know? Like take, how many, if you're counting your macros, how many carbs do you count for steak? That's muscle protein, there's glycogen in there. If you're eating a pound of steak, what are you getting? You're getting like one gram, two grams of carbs. So the carb up isn't that crazy, you know? If it was that crazy, then we would have to count the carbs that are in our steak. They're in there, they're glycogen, one or two grams per pound, and it's the same for us. So the carb up does improve your look, but fullness is water. It's not carbs. Glycogen, the reason carbing up brings, full, brings fullness is because of the water in the glycogen. Glycogen is like one part glucose and then four to four and a half parts uh, water, and then sodium is kind of the carrier for it. And so, Knowing all that, what does everyone think they have to do in, contra in peaking? Cut sodium, right? How are you going to store glycogen? Sodium is required to store glycogen, you know? I'm gonna, or, and then they're going to cut water while they carb up. Carbing up, requires Carbing up requires almost over four times as much water as carbs. You can't carb up when you're drying out, you know? So, like, people, everyone does, worries about the wrong things. Worry about being dry. You can, you can win a show flat and dry 
unless you're one of the 20 mass monsters on Earth, you can't, you know, unless you're Marcus Rule, you're not winning a show soft but really full. None of, none of us are gonna look like, we're not gonna freak everyone out by how full we are. That new ne Neckzilla or whatever, you, do you guys see that guy? The new guy, I can't remember his name. With it. He, he's someone who can win a show on fullness. We're not him. <laughs> we have to win on conditioning and dryness. Uh, what would your thoughts be on like a long-term low-dose hemolog use for somebody to kind of mitigate body composition in a non-competitive setting? Like, can you use it almost like therapeutically long-term? Mm -hmm. I don't like to do that because it's your, yes, your blood sugars will be improved, but not improved because your insulin, sens your insulin sensitivity will be worse. You know, it's like, uh, what would be the analogy? It's like, you know, when... A, this, this cup never fills up because I drilled a hole in it, you know? It's, you're, you're still pouring water in the cup, you know? If you put that on your sink, you're gonna, your water bill's gonna go up. And that's kind of what, uh, people are always using insulin and Lantus uh, to, to improve their blood sugars. And yes, it will improve your blood sugars, but the, the problem is that your blood sugars are elevated because your insulin sensitivity is low. And it's like, it's like saying, you know, like, like to an alcoholic, the cure for alcoholism, you know, is drinking more alcohol. Yes, you don't go through DTs, but you're not improving your you know, alcohol sensitivity. And that's, what, that's basically what you're doing. You're improving your blood sugar because you're just using more insulin and getting less insulin sensitive. And I, to, to go back to what I meant to say on the ins why I use insulin three times a day on high day, it actually, I don't like the using insulin around training every workout. And here's why. If you use Humalog, you get about three hours, three good hours of really super physiological insulin levels. You know? And so you take it every workout, you get three hours of increased rates of muscle growth. Five workouts a week, that's 15 hours a week, right? So if, if uh, the, the real, the half-life of Humalog is really like, more like six hours, but after about three hours it dips so much, it's not really super physiological. If you do it my way, like every other meal, then right as it's dipping and it's starting to go under that super physiological level, the next dose comes in, and those two combined keeps you above that level. And so you can get 18 hours, so 18 hours of super physiological levels of insulin in one day. So in, in the, using insulin every day around training, five days a week, you get 15 hours a week, and you only get two days a week without insulin. So your insulin sen sensitivity is getting hammered five times in a week. My way, with only one high day a week, we're getting 18 hours of super physiological levels, and then we get six days where we're not screwing up insulin sensitivity. And then if we do two high days a week, we're you know, 36 hours. We're already more than double, and we've only used insulin twice a week. And you think, but I want to grow every day. Yes, but growing happens over time. You know, like it's, it's the hours where you're, where you're optimized for growth. It's not how many days you're optimized for growth. And because people, th people worry about the training too much. Yes, uh, muscle protein synthesis is elevated after training, but if you look at the studies, it's, it's pretty similarly, similarly elevated for an hour and a half after every meal. Eating a meal elevates uh, muscle protein synthesis almost as much as training. We put, all, we put all this worry and emphasis around training, but that's just one little thing. And even if we double the rate of muscle growth, and Todd knows this, I do, I've talked about this a hundred times, but if you double the rate of muscle growth for that, those three hours, how much muscle are you actually adding? Does anyone ever do the math on how much, because muscle's made of protein, right, amino acids. So like, you know, uh, 500 grams of amino acids is, it's half a kilogram, which is 1.1 pounds, right? So if you're eating 500 grams of protein, every ounce of mu less than 1.1 pounds of muscle you're gaining a day, it means that protein isn't being used for muscle protein synthesis. And so I, what I like to do, because it makes it easier to do the math, if you can convert one gram of muscle protein synthesis per hour, or about 25 grams of protein a day, if you can actually use 25 grams of protein a day for new muscle, if you add that up, that's 20 pounds of muscle weight from amino acids in the course of a year. But that's actually misleading, because muscle's 70% water. Well, it's only 30% amino acids or pro protein structures. So really, if you break it down, if you convert 19 grams of protein to new muscle per day, of all the protein you're eating, 300 grams, 400 grams, 200 grams, 500 grams, if only 19 grams of it converts to muscle, that's 50 pounds of muscle growth in a year, right? So we're doing less than one gram of protein synthesis per hour. Less, way less, most of us are doing like five grams a day. Because if we even do 1.9 grams a day, we're adding five pounds of muscle a year. How many people here have added 50 pounds of muscle the last 10 years? You know? So most of us, we're, using, we're converting like five grams a day. So like a fraction of a gram per hour. So what is, what is 
So if I'm converting 0.25 grams of protein to new muscle in an hour, and I increase my insulin, you know, those three hours around training, that's, uh, that's 0 0.75 grams of muscle every workout. You know, there, there's, you know, take how many, uh, how many workouts it takes until you get a pound of muscle growth increase from that. It's years, you know. So you want to maximize the time that insulin is super physiological without screwing insulin sensitivity. And the multiple use per high day is what I, I believe to be the best for that. Because it gives you two high days a week, it gives you more than double the hours where insulin is super physiological and more than double the days where your insulin sensitivity isn't getting hammered. So a follow-up on your comment on muscle protein synthesis. Protein is used for more than just muscle. You know, there's a lot of protein turnover. So can you speak to the fact of how much protein you need per day to cover all of that and then have more left over for the muscles? No one really knows, but it's not very high. It's probably on the low end for normal, like, protein turnover of your organs and, you know, like I, you know, like I bumped my hip on this and that's a damaged tissue. You got to repair all that. Repair from your tr hard training. I think I remember reading one time that there was like 50 grams of muscle protein or damaged protein, uh, protein turnover with a marathon. It was something like two grams per mile, you know. So if a marathon runner only needs 50 extra grams when they run a marathon, we're probably less, th we're probably on the order of 50 grams a day. But even if but I don't want to test that. I'm not going to risk, I'm not going to find the limit. So I'd say, you know, like, maybe it's 50, but it could be 100. So I'm going to say it's 100 at least. And I'm going to say more than that, you know, for, for some of the, like, the men here, I'll say 150 at least, you know. And then we want, you know, I would never go less than, like, 175 then. And people think that's crazy low, but Jay Cutler was 300 pounds eating 180 grams of protein a day, you know, 1,500 grams of carbs. Because it's not how many grams of protein you eat. You know, everyone thinks that if that was the problem, we would just eat 1,000 grams of protein a day. You know, that's 2.2 pounds of muscle every day. We gain, you know, 800 pounds of muscle a year. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, so people, I think, like, just throw, throw more protein at the problem. No, you don't. Like, you're not, you're playing a dartboard. You can either throw, like, you know, throw 500 darts, keep it that way and hope they hit a bullseye, or you can get really good, you know, at playing darts. And that's what you want to do. You want to be really specific because we only need 19 extra grams of protein synthesis. So rather than just throw a bunch of protein, we want to do what maximizes the likelihood that protein synthesis occurs. And that's proper use of insulin, proper use of carbohydrates, proper use of fats. So, yeah, and I always do that protein argument, and then everyone's like, well, prove it then. What, you only eat 25 grams of protein a day? It's like, no, I, I'm just saying, I know I'm not getting more synthesis than that. I'm saying, rather than just dump protein on the problem, I want to know how I can make sure I get that 25 grams a day. I wonder if you can speak a little bit to digestive issues that come up at the tail end of a prep, mm -hmm. assuming no orals are in place. Uh, I don't know if this will be the exact response or question is asking, but like the, the guts you see, uh, I don't believe by, from GH. I mean, GH has, like, if you look at acromegalix, they have a wider torso. There are some like physi physiological changes that happen over time, but the distended guts, in my experience, is really, it's like, it's all fecal matter. It's, Compacted shit. Because what happens is you have all these carbs and calories in the off season, and then to, to provide bulk for all those carbs and calories, all this water has to go into the colon and, and mix with it. Well, when you get into a contest diet, you remove all that, you're going much higher protein, much lower carb, and, and fat is very watery, and so you're losing all the water in your body. You know, as you lose fat, you lose water. So even though you're not dehydrated, but as your body mass goes down, your fluid volume goes down, all your excess water goes down, you don't have as much water in the body. And so little things start affecting how much water goes into the gut. Uh, and so, and, and I, this is really crappy, I guess, the way I, I kind of like came about this, but I noticed that over the years, my clients who had bubble guts, who had the problems with their gut, uh, correlated very closely with those who I knew had opiate problems. And opiates also dry out your gut. And then uh, just from kind of noticing that and looking through trends, I've seen it happen repeatedly when I get a client that comes to me with really bad distension, you know, in their, in, you know, in their update templates and they tell them all their medicines, they're, you know, on tramadol, they're on Vicodin, they're on uh, oxycodone, you know, they're on some kind of opiate and usually a pretty good dose because they've probably been on it for a long time. And then so that everything dries out their gut and you just don't move things through there. And it starts out, they get distended here first, really low, you know, lower abs. And then it kind of builds. And once it starts building, and once you get it distended and inflamed and impacted, 
fecal matter, that's, you're going to hold more water in that area, and it's just going to keep, uh, keep uh, expanding. So that, like, if you're talking about digestive problems for that type of thing, what I recommend is there's two products that will kind of lube the chute, so to speak. Du there's Ducalax, Docalax, which is a laxative that's not like a contractile laxative, doesn't make you, like, your, you know, your, your intestines contract and move things through. It increases mucus production of, of your intestines, so that helps kind of lube the whole area. Another one is an osmolaric laxative called Miralax. There's a couple different ones that uses like propylene ethyl glycol. And that same thing, it increases the amount of water that goes in the colon. So Docalax and Miralax are what I recommend. If that's the kind of late contest digestion issues, uh, that's usually what you see mostly because appetite's so high and gastric emptying so high, you don't usually find people, you see a lot of reflux uh, issues, uh, but and then we could talk about that, but reflux is kind of tricky because people say, talk about indigestion and reflux is like interchangeable. You know, like reflux is not necessarily an overproduction of acid, but somehow the acid is getting above the sphincter, of the upper, you know, top of the stomach. That's different than indigestion. Indigestion is probably, in a lot of cases, not enough of acid, and that, you know, the food's not moving through properly. And I, I just always see people kind of speak on them interchangeably, you know, because if you have like indigestion, a highly acidic, uh, Something like apple cider vinegar would help maybe in, in, increase some in, uh, acidity of the stomach and maybe help that. You can make the argument that like an apple cider vinegar will supply the acid so your body doesn't have to make as much acid and so you won't get the reflux, but that's, I don't think that's as good of a treatment for reflux as I see people say all the time. In a contest prep diet, what considerations or client feedback is helping you decide whether to adjust the calories across all the medium days or keep the medium days the same and add another low day? That's tough because I don't have, you know, like, it's weird when you do something for so long. I remember because physics is, I, my, my master's is in physics, and so I really love math and physics. And there's a, a, a Russian physicist, Landau, who wrote a really popular biomechanics book, uh, or mechanics book, classical mechanics, and I think he has a Nobel Prize. But he said like he had difficulty teaching calculus because he couldn't remember a time he didn't know how to take a derivative of a function. You know? And I, that's kind of where I'm at with things. I don't even know where, how my decisions come. I've, just, I've done this all day, every day, for over 20 years. You know, I wake up every, like the last two nights, because I had someone competing in Australia, so the last two nights I've had to do client check-ins every three hours through the night, you know, and then I have people competing this morning, and I have people competing basically every weekend from April through November, uh, and for 20 plus years. So like, there's so many things that I don't remember a time when I didn't know how to do it, so I don't even know my thought process anymore. I really don't, uh, it's, <laughs> so it's not a good answer, but yeah, I don't, it just, so, somehow you just know, you know, you do things enough times, you just, you just know. I don't usually add low days anymore, though. That, what I do is, because my medium days tend to have more carbs around training, and I, I typically just lower the calories in all medium days rather than add low days. I used to, I used to replace medium days with low days, but because I make so much use of intra-workout now, and then I keep the intra-workout pretty late into the diet for most people, I don't do that anymore. I mean, by the end, you know, the medium days look kind of like low days, but they're, they're still de de described differently or, or named differently. Sorry, that's not a good answer. This is a follow-up to a previous question. Um, rather, why use Humalog three times a day to create the 18-hour window rather than using Lantus mm -hmm. and or stacking berberine with that Lantus? Mm -hmm. that, and that's a good question. And I, wanted, I would say you probably, you could probably make an argument that that's better. But my reasoning is the, the precision, because, you know, Lantus is just so much more diffuse and, you know, I can be really precise where I'm choosing my carbs and insulin, choose my insulin each meal, you know, because with land, it's <coughs> you have one chance for the day and that's it, you know, like, so if I me measure too much and I start going hypo, I have to eat more calories in a plan and I know my high days are pretty much at the limit, so if I add calories it now, rather than a, like a muscle growth day and a glycogen storage day, it probably is turning into a fat storage day, so I want to minimize the risk of that. With Humalog, I get, you know, more, you know, it's kind of, you know, like, really precise darts again, you know? I mean, you can make an argument for that, and I don't, because you're gonna get more than 18 hours at super physiological levels that way, but that's kind of my reasoning is, 
as a coach, I'm not working with robots and I'm not working with physicians, you know, and it's, easy. I like to have, I like to be in and out because if a client fucks up with an insulin dose and they will, no matter how well you, you know, no matter how well you describe how to measure it, they will. If they fuck up with one Humalog dose, we just got to get a bunch of sugar in them and, and three hours later they're good. If they, if they take like, you know, three mLs of Lantus or something, well, because people do, I mean, people, People lose their mind. It's like they, 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 the first time they take a product that they know can kill them, and they won't like, they, you know, like the old saying, measure twice, cut once. They'll be like, yeah, I'll, I'll measure once, you know. Just not even think. I've had that happen so many times. People thinking one IU is one CC or 10 IUs is one CC. And so with Humalog, we, get, we have three hours to keep them alive. With Lantus, it's like, all right, we're going to go on a ride here. It's going to be a long day. But with someone who's, you know, knows what they're doing, yeah, you can make the argument that that's arguably better. For individuals who are hypogonadal and an extreme case of muscle wasting, uh, would the application of insulin, whether it's fast acting or long acting, be a poor, let's say, choice of application, if you will? It, it would, would it, I didn't hear the end. Would, would, would it be a bad idea to apply insulin in this no, case? No, it would be a good idea. Yeah, it would be a good idea. If you're, like, hormonal muscle wasting, you're still... Because there's, lo there's lots of things involved. It's not just hormones, because obviously everyone knows like the, the, the huge jacked guys that don't take anything and don't even work out. So there's a lot of other players other than just hormones. But hormones are really kind of the main one. But yeah, if you're hypogonadal and you're, you, you need to maximize you know, every, every, other op every other way of muscle protein synthesis you have. And so insulin would be... And so insulin's really weird, because the argument for years was whether it was anabolic or, or anti-catabolic. And I always used to say it's not directly anabolic because it's main action, it isn't. It does have an additional a a action that is technically purely anabolic. So, you, so I guess, I don't even remember what it is. It's one of those like PK7106 things that I maybe learned at one point, but I don't remember. But uh, insulin is not really anabolic, but it, it makes sure that if anything else in your body is anabolic, you are optimally able to, you know, to have that anabolism because it, but it really just from the amino acid intake. It's like, like I did with that, with the shower drain and letting, allowing more aminos to get into the muscle. Because muscle, pro, muscle protein synthesis is rare. It's not, like, it's hard to happen. There's 20 amino acids, uh, 11 of them you have to get in the diet. All 20 have to be present at the cell when, when muscle protein synthesis is triggered. So if this, if I, if I train arms and my bicep sends a signal for muscle protein synthesis and I ate a ate a crappy incomplete protein that was, so my rate limiting amino acid was an important and essential amino acid, and there aren't all 20 amino acids available there, then boom, muscle protein synthesis doesn't happen. Or worse, if I ate a complete, say like, I, I know this for some reason, but the, the rate limiting amino acid for corn is L-tyrosine. I, I know I know this. I made an argument one time that that's why uh, uh, certain uh, uh, Native American cultures were more prone to war. It was, like not, it was almost tongue in cheek, but I had to like make an article once for it. Because I said, because corn is the rate limiting OS is, is L tyrosine, and L tyrosine is the precursor for serotonin. So, like the, you know, the love hormone, they, it's a dumb argument. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in that case, like whatever the rate limiting amino acid is, that's how much most protein synthesis can possibly occur if all of them are present. So, it's, you, like, you, you have to cherish, you know, like, like my precious, you know, that's your, your muscle protein synthesis. It doesn't, it's rare. So it's going, going back to like, don't just dump protein at the problem. You need to be precise with your protein. That's why I, that's why, well, I'm not wearing it anymore. That's why I had the steak rice repeat, chicken rice repeat, because meat-based proteins are all complete proteins. I could go on a, like a tangent on this, but complete proteins are weird. Because uh, if you look at food, uh, food groupings, like you go to Latin America and you, like beans and rice is a really common meal. You know why? Because the people who ate rice died. The people who ate beans died. The people who ate beans and rice, both of them are incomplete proteins, but w when combined, they form a complete protein. They didn't die. And so, and like food choices around the world are like that. Like, they use, that's why steak and potatoes. Because potatoes, you're not going to survive on. You, you get protein deficient in, in essential amino acids. But if you apply a meat protein source to it, that culture lives, you know? How um, efficacious, if at all, do you feel like fat loading is for intramuscular yeah, triglycerides? Yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, yeah, I think so. I don't know how much, 
I mean, I, I remember finding a cool study once that showed uh, short-term fatty acid infiltration of the muscle tissue with really high-fat meals. That was interesting, and it, and it definitely seemed like it was not, you know, like non-zero to the point that it would make a difference in fullness. And so ever since then, I utilize it. But what I use it is less for the, like using fat loading. I use it for the cal a non-watery calorie source. So my peaks are basically we carb you up while water's high. We don't we don't lower sodium. We want sodium, you know, up there stable, not high, but stay. Stable, we don't want to increase it, whatever it's been in prep. And we keep, while water is still high, we do all our carving up. Because like bodybuilding or peak or contest prep is really like a series of stages. For stage one is body fat, nothing else matters. Guys worry about their flat, they worry they don't look good, they worry, you know, that doesn't matter. At stage one from like 16 weeks or 12 weeks, whenever you start until you're lean enough, all you worry about is body fat. Then once you get the body fat off, then you worry about prettying up the physique. You know, but that's like where they're saying like, you have to be flat in prep if you want to be full on stage. Because the guys that worry about, oh, I'm too flat, or, you know, don't worry about that until you get the fat off. You know, then, then pretty up the look. And then, but then pretty up the look is a multi-stage process. Stage one is carving up. If you try to dry out while you're carving up, you're doing two completely opposite things. Glycogen storage means water is being stored. Drying out means water is not being stored, it's being excreted. So they're like two, you know, it's like trying to run up the down escalator, you know. So don't go run up the up escalator, carve up while water's high, uh, and, and then dry out. And then when I dry out, I don't want to flatten out, you know? Because once we carb up, the glycogen's there until we burn it off, you know? And that's an interesting thing too, because I always hear, uh, like people will say, like I train legs and my upper body flattened out. And I, I, I probably should look this, should have looked this up before I said this, but as I remember correctly, the liver, glycogen, liver releases glycogen to maintain stable blood glucose levels. So liver glycogen goes systemically. Muscle glycogen is only used by that muscle. So your legs will flatten out when you train legs. You don't use glycogen from your upper body. Those muscles are not being used. That's a, just a common thing that I always see kind of said incorrectly. I never see anyone bring up. But anyways, uh, after we're full and we're trying to dry out, we don't want to lose our glycogen, you know, because we're going to be moving around and walking, and, and that does, like, my arms are using glycogen right now. And so we, we want to hold fullness. But we can't hold fullness with carbs because carbs need water. And so the day before show when we're drying out, I take the fats quite a bit higher to keep the calories high while carbs are lower. And so basically we do, most people do too. Some of my like really big, like a Joe Seaman, who, he needs like 3,000 grams of carbs over the carb up. We'll do three days for him, it's two and a half maybe. And then one, so, but most people are two days of carbing up. Females are usually one day. And then the day before the show, we dry out with fats quite a bit higher to keep calories higher. You have both male and female athletes, and I know Dana's going to the Olympia, so I'm excited to see her there. Do your strategies change between the female physique athletes and the male physique athletes? I do, mostly because women are completely, un uh, you tell them to calm down and they just don't listen. <laughs> no, they're really, they're really not that different. And I got an argument with uh, someone who wanted to buy my shredded, uh, my shredded uh, ebook because it asked for your height, weight and body fat percentage, but it doesn't ask if you're male or female. And a female, client, a female customer was really angry and you know, said that that wouldn't work. And I said, no, my, the diet is based on your, you know, your height and your, your body composition. And so that tells whether you're female. I mean, and if, you, know, if, you're, if you have 76 pounds of lean body mass and you're five foot two, if you are a male, you're gonna have the same diet as a five foot two female who has 70 pounds of muscle mass. So it really doesn't change that much. It's just what changes is women get screwed in dieting. Because like, uh, like, like I said, Paul Barnett, he, can, he might be able to eat 6,000 calories a day at his peak metabolism without getting fat. To burn two pounds of fat a week, you need a calorie deficit of 1,000 calories a day. So we can drop them all the way down to the paltry 5,000 calories a day and burn two pounds of fat a week. Like a small female, your BMR might be as low as 1,500. So for you, with, without exercise and everything, to just straight be in a calorie deficit just from the diet to lose 200 pounds of fat a week, you can only eat 500 calories a day. What's that gonna do? Your thyroid's gonna go to shit, your metabolism's gonna shut down, you have no energy, you're not gonna be able to build muscle or train well. And so that's the, that's the difference with women, is guys, you, like, I mean, it's like a, I don't know, like a, like a it's like a, like a tank gun, you can, you know, it's like, just, you got so much leeway, you know, like I can overshoot, I can go too, I can overshoot too low in calories and we only feed him 4,000 calories a day. He's still eating a ton of food and now he's losing fat too fast. With women, it's always the, 
it's a very fine line. We max out at two grams of fat per week, you know? So if you need to lose 30 pounds of fat and we only have 16 weeks, we need every single week to be absolutely on point perfect. So that, that's the biggest thing is you guys don't get to get as, as high above your contest weight in the off season. And we just don't have as many, as much room to play really. And so you just, you just, you just get screwed. You have like, you have no room for error. And but well, what's crazy though, because women aren't worried about having enough muscle, they tend to be in better shape on stage, despite having it so much harder. And this will be the last question. I like the shirt. Thank you. Uh, so when it comes to intra-workout carbs, how much does that change between like a high day versus a regular day? And then you're also talking about, you know, 3,000 grams of carbs for like a two-day carb up. Like do you utilize any like liquid carbs for that, and what kind of concentration do you do for carbs to water? So we, it's got a three different answers. Uh, just as standard, in my high day diets, I, have, I ask you to do 50% of the carbs for any given meal from complex sources, and up to 50% can come from sugary sources. Uh, now, all things aren't equal. You, you could eat Twizzlers, and technically from a macro standpoint, you'll be, you'll be correct, but I find that people feel really terrible when they eat that many processed sugars. So I recommend that you eat fruit or fruit juice. But on high days, typically up to 50% of carbs in each meal can come from sugary sources. And people are like, you're, pre you're prepping and you're eating that much sugar? If, like someone your size is gonna be over 900 grams probably. So you're eating 450 grams of complex carbs. You know, you're eating, you're eating a lot of complex carbs already, adding some sugar onto that. You're just, your insulin's sky high all day no matter what at that point. Now in the carb up, and, and we'll use an intra. My intra basically, just kind of as a stock standard answer, it's gonna be double on high day what it is on, low, on medium days. And I used to push them a lot hard, higher. I used to go up to like 100 grams of intercarbs uh, high days. The problem is, is high molecular weight carbohydrates have such a low osmolarity that they can cause dumping syndrome. They get through the stomach so fast in the small intestine that they just kind of pull all this water with them. And the dumping syndrome is aptly named because you have to go to the bathroom and dump it out. Uh, so which is why with field rations, we have 20% of the carbs are, are glucose to bring the osmolarity up just enough so the guys that want to really push the carbs can. But that was kind of why I changed because I, I, there were no product, all the products were either straight waxy maize or straight high molecular, or highly branched cyclodextrins. And I find when I push guys up to 100 grams, they'd be shitting their pants. So technically with field rations, you could, but I just look kind of, my approach to things have, has adjusted over the years that I no longer really, a couple of my clients are up at 75 grams, I guess, on high days, but most of them, most, like, you would, put, you would start out 25 grams intra on medium day, 50 on high day. I would guess we'd probably get to 50 on medium day at some point with you, uh, based on your size, but that's kind of it. And then in the carb up, no liquid carbs. Uh, and I, because I just don't like, there's, I don't want any risk. I, I prefer rice and rice-based carbs. There's almost no rice allergies. People digest rice really well. You can eat a lot of, you know, like eating 200 grams of carbs from potatoes is, you're eating a lot of potatoes. 200 grams of rice is, an, is not a small amount, but you can get it down with a big spoon, shoveling it in. And by the time you're peaking, you can, you can eat your stomach rips, really, you know. So all we want is something that digests well, you know, is, you know that we've had lots of times in the diet is, you know, hypoallergenic and yada, yada. So, so for my carb ups, they're pretty basic. We, if, we, if we change from that, it'll be like a morning of the show type thing. Like I had a client in Australia who his morning of the show was like 3 a.m. So I was doing this last night, but we had him eat like a full breakfast. Uh, but I, that's like with hash browns and bacon and eggs. And, but I don't ever really have people do that until after we've dried out. Uh, and we dried out and they're still kind of flat. And we, it, we have a short term where we don't need to look good three days from now. We need to just look good for the next eight hours. That's when I do something like that. Okay. And that that's about wraps us up. Uh, thank, I, thank you guys for coming at 8.30 on a Saturday. I would not be here. Uh, so I really, really appreciate it because if I was on the other end, I guarantee the snooze would have got hit. And I, if I came in, it would have been late. So I really appreciate everyone being here. And then especially the questions. Because uh, those always, I just prefer that. Because if I would have talked, I would have just went from at 16 weeks out, we'll do this. At 12 weeks out, we'll do this. And by, by the time I get to six weeks out, half of the people will be sleeping. So thank you. <laughs>